Ja, also mein Name ist Vasilani und ich äh, bin auch, äh, komme, komme aus der Kommission. Äh, ich bin ich, äh, Mitarbeiter des der, äh, der Referats für Zivil-Justiz. Und ich werde meinen Vortrag auf englischer Sprache halten, weil ich bin nicht zuversichtlich in meinem Deutschen. Nie mon français. <lacht> uh, alors, uh, so I switch to English now and uh, would like to talk about two things actually. Uh, the first one is the where we stay with the implementation and the transposition of the uh, directive, the 2019 directive. And uh, you are certainly curious what we are planning to do uh, in the context of the new project we announced, uh, which will be most probably also a, a piece of legislation. But since uh, we have uh, Alexander Bornemann from Germany here, I, I would say that it, this is not decided, has not been decided. <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah, it was that was in the morning session, and, and, and thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. It was really enriching to me. And in the morning session, somebody rightly uh, remarked that whenever the commission puts one foot in the door in terms of legislation, he never <laughs> goes out from the room. And it's this is usually the practice how things work. But of course, this is not something uh, lar pour lar uh, shouldn't be at least uh, action. So it's. We, 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 the history of the new insolvency policy, it was also mentioned, uh, it began in the 90s. Of course, uh, that, uh, at that time, um, aligning the global trend, because the UN CITRA was working on its uh, model law at the same time when uh, the first regulation was negotiated in 1995 in the form of a co convention at that time. So really to focus on the, on the private international law context, creating single rules of conflicts of laws and jurisdiction, and um, then try to ensure the circulation and cooperation between the, the coordination between the different legal systems. So that was the basic approach. And then indeed in 20, uh, 20, 2015, uh, there has been a big shift and we, we just began to harmonize and uh, 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 try to make proposals for, for the approximation of national laws. But this is not, as I say, said, just a large pour large actions. We're sitting, we are sitting in our offices and uh, thinking that, okay, we have already conflict of law, laws, rules, and private international let, let's uh, harmonize substantive law for member states. That's not how it works. So uh, we have uh, actually a big, so, the harmonization concept is more than 10 years, uh, goes back more than 10 years ago when uh, Klaus Heiner Lehn, uh, the, the chairman of the jury committee in the European Parliament prepared a report in 2011 and there has been a parliamentary resolution for promoting the, uh, the recast, actually partly the, the, the revision of the insolvency regulation, but this uh, the resolution contained also a chapter on the, on the approximation of in certain areas or of certain aspects of national laws. And actually, this is the root. But of course, the real incentive or the trigger came in 2015 uh, with the headline ambition of the Commission of the Capital Markets Union because we realized in the consultation process with the stakeholders and mainly, of course, with the investor side, so the banks, that there is a re it, it, is, it is in the reality, it is a genuine problem that uh, there is this fragmentation between the national laws in terms of insolvencies and uh, that the outcomes of insolvencies of failed companies are, cannot be anticipated for, uh, for investors uh, or very differently on a high cost. So this uh, element uh, posed itself as a, as, a, as a barrier to the smooth functioning of the internal market and to the um, development of the single or the capital markets union. So this is the, the main triggering or the main motivation behind our uh, efforts. And then the first step, as you uh, yeah, can see, it was the, the 2019 directive on restructuring and insolvency. Somebody also very rightly and wisely in the morning uh, stated or concluded that this has been probably because uh, it, it is a specific, it is, this contained a specific piece of legislation, meaning it is a, it focused on, on targeted areas uh, and which, which were considered as new to uh, several uh, legal systems. 
Title II and Title III, the, the first the preventive insolvency proceedings and the debt discharge proceedings. And indeed, in many member states, majority of the member states, preventive proceedings did not exist before. Uh, preventive restructurings and uh, in a majority there was uh, not, so not comp competitive uh, version of uh, personal debt discharge for entrepreneurs. So these were kind of new elements uh, which we proposed to the uh, legal systems and didn't really touch the, 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 the sensitive areas of insolvency law. So and indeed that was the idea behind uh, that let's make this first step, let's so enter a step-by-step -step approach and uh, let's begin with a, with a element where the political feasibility looks more uh, beneficial than, than in, in touching or jumping into a, a big code or a general harmonization of insolvency laws. Um, yeah, now we are in the, place of, in the, in the phase of transposition, uh, you certainly know. So the original deadline was in the directive uh, 17 July last year, but uh, the legislator included a possibility of opting out or on an exceptional basis by way of derogation. Uh, if the member states encounters particular difficulties, then uh, they may request and then granted with an extension of one year, uh, I mean extension of the transposition period. And, Little we know at that time about the COVID, <laughs> because it was, of course, before 2019, but that was the main ground for the majority of the member states. And as you may see, 23 of, uh, of the member states, they uh, notified or requested the extension. So for them, the, the, the notification deadline and the transposition deadline will uh, expire July, 17 July this year. Um, we have, of course, the, for the other force, we have received uh, official notifications, not for the others. Yet, uh, but we have, as, as we could hear, uh, so the other member states also made the, uh, a lot of them the reforms, and we have informal, informal, unofficial knowledge of that. So uh, we will then begin with the then begin with the transposition check. This is a usual exercise we do. I don't want to enter into procedural internal procedural issues, but usually. Uh, we do transposition check in three phases and uh, with one member states until the first one, the, the one phase is, uh, the preceding phase is not finished, we don't open the second one. So that means that the entire process of these three round of evaluations can take with the member states even years. So it's not like we immediately jump and, uh, and uh, launch infringement if we see or consultation if we see some problems uh, in our interpretation with the national transposition measures. But it, it may end up anyway in, in that one and in three different rounds. So the, for the four or, who are already notified, of course, the non-communication non is over because there was a communication for uh, all the four member states. And now in the process of checking the completeness, but probably uh, results in that will come only later once we, we also do the begin with the uh, completeness check with the, uh, the, the other member states. The completeness meaning that we have to check whether uh, the measures notified uh, coincide or comply with each of the provisions or obligations put into the uh, European legislation. And then uh, finally, the, the third round is the conformity uh, where we, want, we would like to uh, verify whether the uh, the content of the uh, of the national transposing measures is the same as we try to uh, interpret as we interpret the uh, EU Act. Um, usually, we use an external contractor to do the uh, the basic work, the groundwork. But of course, then uh, a very thorough quality check is followed on the basis of the comp comparison tables we receive. Um, yeah, in the process of in the last two years and still, so there are several work streams. The commission is a master of, uh, by which we have to um, uh, ensure the proper uh, transposition. We organized two, in 2020, two transposition workshops when we could discuss with member states, governmental experts, the problems they, or issues they may have raised. Then, of course, we have bilateral exchanges. Um, we, in the context of DG reforms, 
assistance program uh, for several member states. We provided technical assistance. These are not always uh, uh, financial assistance, but, uh, but legal advice and consultation. And what is a, uh, one really uh, important element, and we are very proud of it, is the uh, early warning uh, uh, projects. Uh, as you may see, the first one has been started by DJ Grow and the European Innovation Council. It's an agency of the, the Commission and the SME agency. Um, uh, in 2016, in parallel with the proposal, when we made the proposal for the directive, uh, and um, it was a very successful project uh, with a total amount of 4.8, almost 5 million euros, uh, which included a consortium of 15 partners uh, from seven member states and uh, uh, which finally uh, ended up in an EU network of over 100 experts, early warning Europe experts, uh, who could identify and train 800 mentors or advisors for companies. These are in practice out there in the various member states and of course still uh, can be uh, engaged in uh, by companies, uh, mainly small and medium companies uh, um, uh, in financial difficulties. Um, this very much coincides with the obligation of member states, of course, um, uh, in Article 3, which is to, that they have to create a, a, an early warning alert or early alert system or mechanism, they have to operate, which first, on the one hand, ensure, uh, that, uh, ensures that um, uh, companies in difficulties are in due time in advanced warned or pre-warned pre um, if they are in a financial distress. And second, uh, that's an option, but we would like, to, to see, this would be the general scheme, uh, the, the, uh, that members shall also, or may also ensure that these, uh, after this flagging, the, the, the companies or the enterprises concerned who are in financial distress, and mainly, uh, mainly small companies who don't have the capacity to uh, overcome this distress without any advice, so that they can receive advice or may receive advice and mentoring from um, uh, expected persons. And in this context, uh, this early warning project fits well into this implementation or transposition of Article 3 of the directive. And uh, on this basis, the Commission just launched, once again, uh, DJ Grow was the main service, uh, a new project, which also lasts for three years, which is called the uh, European Early Warning Europe Mentor Academy, and um, which tries to ensure the enhancement of the successes, including the establishment of uh, and develop, development of training modules for mentors and advisors. Um, yes, uh, this is also one work stream in the context of the implementation of the or transposition of the uh, directive. Article 29 uh, obliged the Commission uh, or the EU legislator in, by way of an implementing act to uh, um, establish a standard form for data collection by which member states then afterwards can uh, annually notify, ad aggregate data on, uh, insolvency, on, on, on their insolvency proceedings, all types of data. But, but it is listed very thoroughly and in detailed form in the, in the article of the directive. But in order this to be uh, applied, we have to first uh, adopt uh, an implementing act, a commission implementing regulation. And uh, for, for that, we, we, we can enjoy the support of a committee, a comitology group uh, composed of the member states experts. And we already have, we have the committee. You can check the number the, in the transparency register of the European Commission. And we so far had two, two meetings when we began to discuss the details of the standard uh, data collection form. What is important that when can we exploit the statistical information which will be then, of course, in any future initiatives or projects be used as, can be used as a, the quantitative basis for any, any action. Uh, so the data collection obligation begins the first day of the next full calendar year following the adoption of the implementing act. Now, we are, we are a little bit the commission, the commission side start. But we hope that we can still adopt with the member states and then formally uh, publish the implementing act this year. And that would then mean that the first, uh, uh, so the next year would be 
uh, we have to wait a, a year until the data collection obligation begins with the member states. Yeah, and now I would uh, go to the second major subject of my uh, presentation, which is about the how we that the state of play or um, some information about the preparation of the new initiative uh, on harmonizing uh, certain aspects of substantive insolvency proceedings. This uh, quite complicated title is in the official work program, so this is the the uh, the official title of the initiative we are. Uh, um, this will be the points I will address. We are use, but in, internally we just talk about insolvency three <laughs> you know, as a working as a working title. So uh, as you may see, in the last bullet down uh, at the bottom of the page. Uh, so the commission work program for this year uh, envisaged or announced that we will they will deliver um, an initiative or a proposal in the third quarter of this year in autumn. Uh, which we still um, hope to meet this deadline. Um, uh, and uh, in this context, uh, whether so it was already originally announced the, the project in 2020, the second sub bullet here uh, in, in the new CMU Capital Markets Union Action Plan. And then we just mentioned, uh, talked about a legislative or non legislative initiative, but but, but uh, after the preparation work, the state of play of the preparation we are. Uh, the communication of the, the CMO communication, the progress report uh, on the Capital Markets Union Action Plan uh, of November 2021 already went more into the detail. It said that subject to an impact assessment, so it's still subject to the results of the impact assessment, but the Commission would propose a directive. The exact scope of this directive would be subject to further discussion uh, discussions and the directive proposal could be complemented by a commission recommendation. So this is the, uh, where we, I mean, in terms of the approaches where we stand now. Uh, yes, uh, of course, we um, begin with a broad consultation process. We had an online public consultation um, already launched before Christmas 2020 which uh, lasted until 16 April 2021, so more than almost four months. We received 129 answers to that. These links uh, guide to, to the link of the project initiative and to the public uh, consultation, where we will soon upload the, the factual document containing the summary of the results. I, I don't want to enter too much into the details, but just some uh, figures. So these were how, but what, what is the breakdown uh, per, in, per industries or different branches of the respondents? You may see the, the almost one third, on a one third of the respondents, so, so the relative majority of the different groups were coming from the practitioners and the professionals. These, these were where you are counted it. I mean, the insolvency practitioners also contributed in large number. Then we have 17% uh, the financial sector mainly banks, then uh, from a business and trade, trade sector, to, uh, almost 12%, as you may see. With regard to the public authorities, these include the governments as well, uh, both uh, central, regional, or local. We just have 7% uh, the, the number of the answers. Uh, amounts to 7 or less than 8%, and uh, even from those, uh, one third were from local and regional levels. So we, these um, uh, results may not be considered as representative, at least uh, for the public authorities' views. But never mind, we have uh, consultations with the member states in, in advance, uh, in, in addition to that. And this is the uh, breakdown according to the respondents from the state of origin. You may see Germany is highly overrepresented. They were very, they were very confident, but very, very nice. And also the other big member states. And we have answers altogether from 18 member states. I, 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 don't, I won't enter in all of the uh, exploitation, uh, but I, I, will, I would be ready to share with you uh, upon your, if, if you would like to see. Uh, presentation just focusing on the different uh, breakdowns and the results of the responses. I, I just now will show you two or three charts uh, which you might find it interesting. This is the perception by the stakeholders of how much the, the, the issue of insolvency 
affects uh, the functioning of the internal market. So this is a good feedback uh, to see whether there is really a feeling that, uh, uh, that uh, the fragmentation of insolvency laws causes a problem, at least in a cross-border uh, context, intra-EU. And this is the case. Uh, you may see the light blue in the different uh, lines. It shows actually the, uh, the supporting answer. Uh, so we have absolute majorities in the question of uh, differences in relation to avoidance actions. I mean that stakeholders responded that they fear that this is a problem which really affects the functioning of the internal market or the differences with regard to the asset tracing and uh, the tracing and identification of assets belonging to the insolvency estate, but we also had quite a high number with regard to the uh, conditions of insolvency trigger or the ranking of claims, as you may see. These uh, breakdown of the answers according to how we should address or which form of uh, action we should take. What here is on the only relevant, I think that the majority, vast majority of the respondents thought that something must be done, at least uh, some action should be done. And only six uh, responded that no, that no measures is needed and the other six uh, percent said that uh, couldn't answer or didn't answer this question. Uh, I just took this out because this may be relevant for you. Uh, also, with regard to the questions on whether we should address the regulate the professions more deeply compared to what we have in the 2019 directive on the insolvency practitioners, uh, we have a quite positive uh, approach to that support. Uh, support among stakeholders for harmonization of various aspects. We have is the duties, responsibilities, and powers of the IPs. And uh, the second sub-question um, actually lists the main uh, titles in the uh, main headings of the uh, uh, relevant documents under setting, uh, created by standard setting parties, but which we can refer to mainly as the, is the EBRD Insolvency Office Holders Principles, which has been just redrafted and up updated recently. So uh, when asked, uh, all of the different lines of these uh, these uh, standard standards. Then uh, we have the majority or absolute majority of the respondents who said that this should be a good candidate for uh, European action. Uh, still, uh, that was the public consultation, but we have other types of consultations, of course. Uh, uh, selected, we, we had a workshop with a selected group of stakeholders from various industries just two weeks ago, and this week we had a specific meter with, uh, meeting with governmental experts. Um, yeah, yes, uh, uh, a real booster to our work and the, our greatest help so far is the, our expert group, dedicated expert group, which had it ori its origin in the Previous initiative already, they helped us, I mean, at least 20 experts who were member of that group. And uh, this has been exp extended in 2020 uh, with 10 so-called type B experts. They are experts who are representing a common interest shared by uh, particular policy um, uh, stakeholders. As you may see, these were the conditions. So this became a group of 30. We had nine meetings uh, until January. Actually, the group, we are very satisfied with the results. So they are really helping us and they are still working, although so, so we don't have any more meetings planned. Normally the meeting reports uh, should be published in the registry, transparency registry under the name of the commission or the committee. Uh, and uh, so the reports are ready, but maybe we have not yet published the meeting reports, but we are on, on, in process of doing that. That's just the, just the technical issue. Yes, also in line with the preparation, uh, we uh, commissioned two different studies, which were strongly linked to the, which are linked to this uh, initiative as well. Although the forum shopping uh, study was uh, uh, requested or required from the commission in the review article of the insolvency regulation. But finally, it turned out that it's very much uh, linked to, the, uh, to this project because one element, uh, the second bullet point or assignment the contractor had to analyze was the, the different incentives for forum shopping. And in this context, uh, 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 a chapter, a separate chapter of the final study, which has been just uh, adopted by us, not yet published, but will be soon, 
uh, uh, looks at the uh, at the fragmentation of the differences of the insolvency regimes. How much this fragmentation contributes to the incentives or serves as an incentive to forum shopping. So I think that this is also very useful to understand at least the political feasibility of uh, different actions in the various aspects. This study is also very good in responding or confirming what has been stated in the morning by the one of the, in the panel discussion, namely that, uh, uh, that the scheme, how the circulation of the scheme of arrangements or partly under still under UK law, but not exclusively, and uh, uh, similar purpose uh, uh, schemes like the preventive insolvency uh, restructuring uh, frameworks uh, under national law, can we ensure how the, uh, the situation of the effects or uh, the situation of the decisions taken in these proceedings? Uh, because it was addressed that the insolvency regulation only accepts those uh, which are public, fully public proceedings. Uh, this was a policy decision by the EU legislator. We had a lot of discussion when we discussed the recast, but that was the clear view that also a kind of mistrust from, <laughs> from the legislator, a usual mistrust to, to anybody who is negotiating in secret, leaving out some creditors. But we, we uh, decided, I mean, the EU legislator decided that only those uh, proceedings, insolvency proceedings can benefit from the uh, free circulation of the insolvency decisions and the uh, circulation of the effects of the proceedings who are completely public uh, as of the beginning and therefore uh, accessible and uh, to all of the potential creditors. Therefore, the insolvency regulation is not generally up, uh, good for, um, uh, for all types of uh, preventive restructuring uh, procedures, especially not for the not public ones, the confidential ones. And then the, the study uh, analyzes very thoroughly uh, whether these, uh, under the current legal framework, whether the effects of these preventive frameworks can uh, can circulate or have an effect in a direct effect in another member state on the basis of the Brussels one regulation. If the there was a judicial decision, a court sanctioning, of course, uh, at the end, or if not, we are talking just about the private work workout uh, agreement of the parties, whether this has and for direct effects under the Rome uh, Rome one. Why not? Although both instruments apply. The exception, the so-called famous bankruptcy exception, but the problem is that it's subject to interpretation whether such workouts are uh, in, um, uh, interpreted as uh, belonging to insolvency law or, or company law, because the UK scheme of arrangement is clearly a company law uh, um, uh, scheme and not uh, an insolvency scheme, uh, according to the UK legislator. So the, the conclusion in this chapter uh, of the study is that this, uh, this re requires um, an authoritative decision, either by a legislator or by the CG, the Court of Justice of the European Union in the future, to, to create clarity, and because the, the case law is, not, uh, uh, is also diverse in this respect. Yeah, uh, we have a second study as well. Also, at the, at the uh, line of the getting adopted, which directly feeds into the, to our work on the, uh, on, the, on the preparation of this initiative. It's about the, the possibilities of asset tracing and recovery uh, in the context of insolvency proceedings, mainly focused uh, to the task and powers of insolvency practitioners. And intra-EU, uh, what, can, what can they do? Uh, apparently, uh, we, we received information that there, ha there is a problem in practice with the application of the relevant rules of the insolvency regulation. And uh, so this, this is somewhere, uh, an area where uh, the situation can be, could be improved. That is one of the conclusions of this study, which will be also publicly available uh, in, a, in a short time. And uh, I am to talking too, too much, but it's, it's all already the last, uh, last subchapter, so I will finish soon. We are now in the project uh, process of uh, finalizing the impact assessment for that, uh, the economic study, of course. Um, for that, we, we have an external contractor uh, and uh, who uh, committed to 
do the, to do the economic modeling uh, according to a very trendy and very convincing uh, uh, econometrics. And this is the so-called system dynamics methodology, which they use. Um, of course, uh, it's, it, it involved, uh, so, so the, the, the weakness every, of everything is that uh, the, the, to get the quantifiable data, of course. But where we don't have quantifiable data, we usually turn to quali qualitative data. And, and uh, I'm a favorite in certain points, we also have to do that. The situation will change once we adopt the data reporting form uh, under the directive, 2019 directive, and member states begin to feed us with uh, statistical data on their insolvency proceedings. So yeah, we will have the scrutiny board meeting in June this year. Um, and uh, this is just addressing some elements of the impact assessment. And this is, I, I, don't, I don't want to enter now into the details, but happy to, to dis discuss afterwards in the break or uh, for questions. Um, so these are the elements or the building blocks, we call it for the impact assessment. Uh, the, the contractor is uh, looking at now, I mean, uh, which are mostly uh, feasible or uh, economically justifiable for any action. And behind the problems, uh, so this is actually the, or the, drive behind, the drivers behind the problems, we grouped up uh, according to two different um, uh, elements or approaches. The first one is the fragmentation, different differences or divergence of national member states systems as such or per se, uh, because alone these difference uh, could get generates uh, additional costs for uh, intra-EU cross-border investors. And uh, the plain conclusion is that for them, this is a barrier, uh, of course, which they have to overcome either, either pay on the one hand, I mean, the costs of learning and familiarizing with themselves of the foreign legal system and the chances of recovering the investment, or as a second, uh, as a lost lost uh, opportunity because then they just uh, see it, it, it works as a deterrence and then they they just don't uh, invest uh, to another member states and that's uh, that's uh, where we really see the problem in the capital markets or the uh, headline ambition and of course the second uh, element we also look at which generates uh, problems is the inefficiency aspect uh, so that they, they are not uh, not all of them uh, member state systems are equally efficient uh, because there are clearly comparable differences between them. Uh, of course, it's very difficult to define a standard model of defining what an efficient insolvency model is. It is almost impossible. The, the last exercise failed to do this was the World Bank doing business. But anyway, <laughs> this was the most broader project ever done and uh, more, uh, more uh, consequent and methodologic, methodological. Uh, but this uh, also influences the, uh, the decisions on the investments and therefore we also see this for the impact assessment as an area of problems. Yeah. So um, thank you for your time and your faith for your patience. <laughs>